You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. We are gathered here as advisors, as scientists. The kind of place we expect a ghost to have to wander. Hey, we all know that we're going to die, baby. I'll help you. I'm something of a witch. Welcome to Mission Spooky. I'm your fantastic host, JC. With me today, as per usual, the queen of everything herself, Kiki, and her local cryptid enthusiast, Cord. How you guys doing today? Ready to talk about Lake Erie. Oh, yeah. Wow, that sounds kind of eerie. Time to get wet and wild. I'm okay. Thanks for asking. I asked, <laughs> I asked both of you. It was an open form. No, no, I'm... I'm... I waited my turn. Oh, okay. It just Jeez. sounded sarcastic. I assume I assume sarcasm. Most of the time with me, you'd be correct, but this time it wasn't. So, um, you guys do anything fun this week? Uh, have anxiety attacks? Is that fun? No. So I went camping. Oh boy, here we go. I went to uh, <laughs> Cherry Spring. Hey, I want I want to go there. Yo, it's cool. It's the one. I swear to God, it's this one campground in Pennsylvania where there's no fucking trees. What? So you're just camping in the sun. It's great at night, but when you're in there in July, and there's no shade. Hold on. You were outside this week? Yeah. You you crazy. We planned the vacation in February. Well, here's your first mistake. We don't plan <laughs> summer vacations in the winter in Pennsylvania. We wait to see what's going to happen because yeah. either we're going to die or not. The thing with Cherry Springs is if you don't reserve it months in advance, you're not getting a campsite. My brother is planning on going camping in two weeks. He decided he was going camping in two weeks yesterday. That, that's how Where's you plan he, camping trips. Where's he going? Rehoboth. Oh, okay. So not Cherry Springs. No. So Cherry Springs only has, I think it's like less than 20 tent campsites and they fill up fast and why why do they it's the darkest sky on the east coast yes and it's also a uh a dark sky sanctuary yep. exactly where I want to go. you can see a lot of stars and shit it was really cool the first night second night it was thunderstorming right it was a lot of fun but no fucking trees <laughs> You can't see the stars if there's trees. <laughs> uh, false. You walk 500 feet up to the oh, observation shit. field and you can see the fucking <laughs> stars there. I need trees in my campsite. No, you don't. It was so hot. It was so hot. A lot of the campsites I've ever been to or campgrounds I've been to in, in previous times, like there's always stuff to do at those campgrounds, like a lake, hiking trails, Cherry Springs is only camping and looking at the stars. That is all they have to offer. Did you invite this place before you went there? <laughs> Define investigate. <laughs> he heard about it from a friend. I went to the website. Like I said, I planned all this out in like February. Right. Okay. All right. Can, can I read part of the website? It's, it's really fascinating. She's going to read a part where it says... There's nothing here except looking at the sky, so be prepared. Yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's no trees. <laughs> and there's no trees, so bring some awnings and shit. <laughs> this is yeah. this is very specific to watching the stars only, okay? Reserve shuttle service and or guide for an enhanced experience. Plan ahead by checking the moon phase. Did you do that before you booked? So we went on a what was this week where it's like a waning it's a not new moon but not half moon waning or waxing i think waning I prefer, like it's, I, prefer, I prefer a garth moon to a wane moon but okay whatever all the new moon weeks were sold out the very next line is dress for cooler weather even in the summertime 80 degrees with no shade is garbage nowhere to okay. run nowhere to hide that's fair you know, check the forecast, arrive before dark, mm -hmm. enhance yeah, we did those with things. guided telescope tour, because this is a national, this is a state park. It is a state park. And I should change some wording here. If you're in campsites uh, one through eight, 
except for seven, some levels of shade. But do not go anywhere else unless you have, like, portable shade, which we did not bring because we were idiots. I also want to say um, that the actual very, very first thing on this list says familiarize yourself with all the great regional attractions and experiences. <laughs> Don't forget your daytime activities are going to be planned around area attractions and experiences. For sure. Like there is the ice mine, uh, which is a mine where that it only produces ice in the spring and summertime. Fascinating. That's cool. Literally. Yeah. It's uh slogan is PA's coolest attraction. I love that for it. <laughs> mm. I'm gonna be honest. My one and only true complaint is why would you not have trees? You heard it here first, everybody. JC hates meadows. <laughs> They're <ripped. laughs> Yes. JC Uh, hates meadows. If there ain't trees there, he don't give a flip, dude. For sure. Don't invite JC unless you bring in trees along. That's what he said. No complaint. No, no. (laughs) No, you're you're 100%. Hey, JC, you gonna come to the barbecue this weekend? Eh, That depends how many trees gonna be there. (laughs) I got three trees right now. One might show up later. Maybe. We'll see. (laughs) It's not really a forest without at least 10. (laughs) All right, guys. We're going to take a quick break for a sponsor and for a promo from one of our podcast buddies. When we get back, we're going to talk about multiple stories from Lake Erie. Chris Bloosh. Do you have to throw on your favorite true crime podcast before bed in order to fall asleep? Same. And it's the very reason that I created Serial Napper. My name is Nikki Young, and I'm here to lull you to sleep or perhaps to give you nightmares with some of the craziest true crime stories that you've never heard of. Each episode of Serial Napper features a different true crime story told succinctly the way that it happened. Just the facts, ma'am. My focus is on unsolved crimes that need more attention, cold cases, and wrongful convictions. While true crime shows can sometimes be graphic in nature, I ensure that the story is told in a way that is respectful to the victims and their families. Now when it's time for bed, you can look forward to 30 minutes of well-researched and detailed case files while you get your beauty sleep. Find Serial Napper on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Sweet dreams. Welcome back. Hey, JC. <laughs> God damn it. I fucking... This is... Yeah. Why are the Great Lakes running out of water? Why? Kiki? I don't know, Cord. I can't figure that one because out. Because Americans are drinking Canada dry. <laughs> <laughs> Get it? <sighs> like the ginger ale? Canada dry! He said that this was going to be a good one. Yeah, I... Hey, you didn't think that was funny? It's it's kind of funny, but that was a for good legal, one. Somebody for thought... legal purposes, I'm not allowed to agree Listen, somebody, that that was. Somebody funny. thought, all right, before they wrote that down, they had a good think. That joke reaction was deader than my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucked up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's going to be blooper real material or not, but you can have that one, I guess. Here's a joke about the Great Lakes that I hate because I think it's stupid and doesn't make any sense. Why doesn't Michigan fall into the Great Lakes? Because Ohio sucks. I I don't understand that. (laughs) (laughs) The answer is just because Ohio sucks. (laughs) Okay, so like, listen, there's a whole slew of jokes that just shit on Ohio. Like, I found a website. Okay, let's just say this. I found a website one day where oh. they start those actual funny jokes shitting on Ohio, and then they just turned into exactly that. Uh, that's why I laughed at that, because if I know the inside joke on that, Ohio State's rival is Michigan State. Fucking sports ball, buddy! So, everybody, we're talking about Lake Erie today, since the jokes didn't fucking take. Hey, right, we're not joking around anymore. The jokes are over. Yeah, we're going to get into some serious. We're getting into some serious boat crashes. And Kiki, are you going to reiterate <laughs> about the cemetery? Or should I say it now? Oh, I have a whole tirade about the cemetery. <laughs> the cemetery's not haunted. 
It's not. Yeah. So if you're trying to do any research at all on like Lake Erie and, you know, Erie comes up, obviously. And we covered the Erie Cemetery before. So I'm going to reiterate that, please, for the love of all that is fucking holy, if you're writing a goddamn blog, can you just please stop saying that the Erie Cemetery is fucking haunted? It's not. Nothing ever happened there. We did all the research. You can go listen to that. It's like the episode, our first episode on haunted cemeteries. There's not a goddamn vampire that lives there. Okay. It, it didn't happen. We did a whole thing on who's actually buried there in that particular place. Let's say this. At the time of that recording, no vampire was living there. Could one have moved in since? <sighs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. No, great, I'll reiterate. A, a great. <laughs> Why? Well, maybe they just did it because now there's a podcast saying that there isn't a va- vampire there. And they're like, oh, no one's going to look there. Everyone listens to Missing Spooky. They're the yeah, okay. the mm-hmm. top paranormal yeah. uh, podcast in the world. <laughs> the, there's no vampire in that cemetery. That's all made up BS. There was a, a another legend attached to that that said that this priest came out and chased the vampire away and supposedly killed him. And that's why the vampire still haunts the cemetery and like none of that happened so anyway so i have a question okay let's say let's say that story happened right Mm -hmm. Uh, i was was wrapping that up let's go with the let's go with the whole it happened the priest came out beat the shit out of this vampire and now the vampire haunts do vampire like vampires have no soul what's haunting the graveyard is it the soul of the human and then he was really mad 200 years later that his vampire corpse self got killed by a priest. <laughs> <laughs> That's a and d module. <laughs> I'm just I'm just here to ask questions. You Let's know? make that shit happen. All right. That's no, that makes a lot of sense, actually. So that's going to be a thing now. <laughs> just an angry ghost following his vampire corpse going, how could you? What happened here? <laughs> that was Charlie. We <laughs> love happened? Charlie. Why did you do that? Why do my teeth look like that? I never had teeth like that. I'm a vegetarian <laughs> for fuck's sake. <laughs> you go to one too many goddamn goth parties. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was wine, okay? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it smelled a little weird and it tastes coppery, but I thought it was just, uh, you know. Organic. Nick wine aged the guy who gave me it said it was aged 28 years so it was a 28 year old <laughs> said it was some aged transylvanian specialty so you know down the hatch but yeah that was that was my <laughs> question you know all right are we done now because i want to talk yeah, about I the thought... actual lake yeah oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so cord you're going first right I would love to go first, because today I don't come with any ghosts. No ghosts. No ghost cord. I come with absolutely nothing spooky. No UFOs, no ghosts, no cryptids. Nothing. The spookiest thing of all. Real life. I figured I should go first because I am doing the least spooky thing, but also it might shed some context on some other things that might be discussed. Okay? I'm bringing to the floor here the NOAA. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is attempting to turn the Lake Erie Quadrangle into a a national marine sanctuary. The Lake Erie Quadrangle is a part of Lake Erie. It's 759 square miles. It includes some harbors, but those harbors are going to still be used, obviously. Their part of this square is not being included in the sanctuary. But this is important because... In this 760 square miles that's on the coast of Lake Erie, it's along the coast, 196 sunken ships are there of all sizes from all years that we've been on this lake. Most of them are completely unidentified still. There's almost 200 boats in this 700 miles of lake. So that that's a lot. The reason why there's so many sunken ships is not just because of storms lake erie has a lot of like shifting sand barges the waters on the coastline are rough even when there isn't necessarily a storm this becoming a sanctuary means that these are now not going to be like uh pillaged i guess you know we might be able to find out who actually sank here 
we're not just talking like Uncle Larry speedboat, you know. We're talking ships from the 1800s. Lake Erie was considered one of the last stops on the Underground Railroad because they would put the slaves on a ship and take them to Canada. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those ships might be in this area. This could be a place for some pretty important discoveries, potentially. So they're trying to, like... Make it so that nobody messes with these <laughs> unless you get permission. That's the important part of this. Yeah, they're trying to keep the Indiana Jones-esque people out. They don't want you stealing all the stuff off of the boat. They just want to find out what boats they were first, <laughs> I think. <laughs> That's what I come to the table with. I think it's interesting. It explains a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> I believe we're talking about some more ships. We are going to talk about some ships. You brought up a good point, but I was looking to see if anything came up, like a specific Underground Railroad ship that sank in the Great Lakes. I know they said Lake Erie. Well, Erie itself was considered one of the, the quote-unquote, last stops on the railroad. Oh, yeah, that's true. I, I would assume the easiest way, at least people would think, would be to just go across water. When I did my Harriet Tubman talk, I mentioned that during that time period when the South was really pushing for legislation federally to fuck up the North because the North was trying to bring freed slaves North, they started like up in Boston, for example, this is where the police started like gathering up men who were already freed and trying to send them back down to the South. So Philadelphia and the surrounding area couldn't be a stop off anymore for a while because of the, the way that I hate to say it, like the, the federal government was almost forced into doing these things because they were trying desperately not to have a civil war, which didn't work because we wound up having it anyway. And it was 100% over slavery. So fuck anybody who says otherwise. But anyway, yeah, I mean, no, it was about states' rights to own slaves. Yes. Yeah. It was, <laughs> I was like, I know were, what you're going to say. <laughs> the, the, let's put this out there. There were other factors involved. It was like 90% slavery. <laughs> like, yeah, there were other things, but. There was a big overshadowing subject. <laughs> All the other things were pointing to the fact that they just wanted free slave labor. They didn't want to have to much, pay yeah. people to do anything. Yep. So, yeah, they, so they wound up having to move people even further out and up into Canada. So Harriet Tubman had set up a new system where she could get people uh, up to Canada. In case anybody missed that or doesn't want to listen to the whole story, then that's fine. That's that's the lowdown on it. But, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. There are tons and tons of ships that were helpful and responsible in moving freed folks up into Canada. The Wisconsin Maritime Museum actually had a whole thing about all the ships that helped move people up into Canada. Cool stuff. I was adding to it because I I agree on the pillaging thing. Actually, one of the ships that I'm going to talk about is very much needs to be protected and possibly has quite a bit of money in it. <laughs> so we should probably save it. But I'm going to give you guys a little bit of fun facts real quick, and then I'm going to let JC talk about what you want to talk about associated with Lake Erie. Dude, I love fun facts. Hit me. So you mentioned, Court, just a little while ago, you know, how ships don't always just sink because they are necessarily uh, storms or anything else. Lake Erie is the smallest, and it's also the shallowest. And because of that, there are all kinds of sandbars. And to reiterate, those sandbars don't always end up in the same spot. They do yeah. move with yeah. the current like the it was sand a real will, bit the sand will shift so <laughs> so uh it's the fourth largest by surface area but the smallest by volume when it comes to the great lakes the states and provinces that lake erie does border which is new york pennsylvania ohio and michigan on the u.s side and then our canadian friends it's borders the province of ontario the surface area is 9910 square miles for anyone doing kilometers, that's 25,700 square kilometers. The depth is 210 feet or 64 meters. So it is the shallowest, as I said. There are several islands in it, which some people might be like, oh, yeah, shit, there's friggin' islands in these things. There's a lot of islands. The largest ones are Pele Island, uh, which is the Canadian side, and then South Bass Island on the U.S. side. And I'm going to talk about that in a ghost story in a few minutes. It's a good thing I didn't cover that one then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was prepared. The ports and cities, the major ones here are going to be Cleveland and Toledo in Ohio, Buffalo in New York, and uh, Windsor, Ontario. And of course, Erie, Pennsylvania. So we got a lot of fish species. I'm going to say these real quick, just a couple of the big ones, because it's going to directly affect maybe something that JC is going to talk about in a minute. 
but I will say I did I did the research and the lake sturgeon is here in this lake. <laughs> also the muskie, which is a very large predatory fish. Some of you guys might know about that one. Uh, the common carp, a channel cat channel catfish, which is also pretty big. Sturgeon always are such intimidating fish to me. They look yeah. like dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. Walleye. So steelhead trout and uh, sheep's head. Oh, the freshwater drum, also known as a sheep's head. Okay, that's what, that's what I was looking at for the other name of it, in case people were like, what the hell is she talking about? That is a pretty big fish, though. Yeah. Lots of aquatic life other than that, like lots of birds. Get a great ecosystem to know the lake is not dead. The oldest, supposedly, the oldest ship that we know of that has sank there was the Lake Serpent, which was a cargo ship. And that sank in sometime uh, September or early October of 1829. There are some really terrible shipwrecks, though. And this is across the lake, the Great Lakes. So the Lady Elgin is probably like one of the most famous ones. That was on Lake Michigan. The Eastland was also in Lake Michigan. And the Edmund Fitzgerald. And that's Lake Superior. Those are probably three that you might have heard before. We're not going to talk about them because they didn't sink in Lake Erie. I'm going to stick with a couple of uh, (laughs) ships that sank in Lake Erie. But however, they are the worst of the worst as far as loss of life goes. Not necessarily the largest ships. Keep in mind, there's a whole other list of the largest ships to sink in in the lakes. But these are just the three worst as far as uh, loss of life. So now that you know a little bit about the lake itself... It is time for JC to regale us with his lovely story of a certain cryptid. I'm hyped. Yeah. I'm not sure if I believe it or not, but go ahead. (laughs) She's being a real skeptic today, eh? I am. I'm skeptical Kiki today. So we're going to talk about, and this is probably my favorite little title and name for this creature, Bessie, Nessie's bestie from the Westie. (laughs) I hate that. Why? I don't know. I saw it and I'm like, that is adorable. Bessie is also another natural animal within the lake system that Kiki forgot with the other fish. Yeah, Kiki, why didn't you why didn't you add the giant lake monster, Kiki? What the heck? Yeah, I I don't understand either. Bessie is a just like Nessie, a potential Plesiosaur or whatever the thing is. Plesiosaur. You want to try Plesiosaur. that again, but <laughs> Plesiosaur. There, there you, you go. go. Thanks. Bessie's estimated to be forty to forty-five foot long and fifteen feet in height at the shoulders. Obviously, a long neck. It has the flippers like a sea turtle or like Nessie. You know, uh, its skin is like a blue gray. There's been sightings of. Bessie ever since truly the 1700s. 1793 is the first recorded one by various people fishing and living in the in Lake Erie or on nearby Lake Erie. And just just for uh, the record before, you know, somebody says Nessie's obviously just like a muskie that's getting misidentified. The largest muskie ever caught. Now there's some controversy with this. But it's either 69 pounds and 15 ounces that was caught in 1957. Very nice. By Arthur Lawson. However, there is some controversy over whether or not the fish was as big as he claimed it to be. So the Uh, largest uh, official without controversy is 67 pounds and 8 ounces caught by Cal Johnson in 1949. Not nearly as nice. Not nearly as nice, but less controversy, you know? Classic fisherman's tale. Yes. Oh, yeah, you were two pounds bigger. How long did you say Bessie was? Big. Oh, okay. 40 to 45 foot long. So I already well, that's that. what's speculated, yes. Yeah, yeah. There's also other speculations that it's 30 to 40 foot. Some say 60 foot. It's a big animal. 20 to 30 foot in length. It just depends on who sees it, which parts they see, how good of a sh- uh, of a sighting they, they have of Bessie. Now, I personally don't think Bessie is one creature, especially that has been seen or sighted for over 200 years. 
200 years. 1793 was when it was first recorded. Cat Zooks. <laughs> yeah. The ranges in size over that time, it there could potentially have been or is a population of creatures in Lake Erie. They could also, you know, potentially travel from one lake to the other through canals or underwater caves. Yeah, you think he's friends? I'm having like an aneurysm. You think he's like friends with Champ over in Champagne? Potentially, or? maybe, maybe they're my they migrate. I don't know, Cord. I don't know. Here's the thing with cryptids, right? I want to believe so hard, but at the same time, I'm like, yeah, they probably just saw a bunch of fucking big fish. What's the other one? Um, well, I'm looking at the sturgeon because you know they can sturgeons, reach yep, over a thousand other. pounds. So, yeah. So- so I have a I have a little bit of a working theory here immediately. Uh huh. Lake Erie has had so many ships sink. What are the chances that they're oh, no. seeing a capsized boat? Oh, okay, that's good. For a minute, I was, I thought you were going to suggest that Bessie actually sank. The boat. <laughs> I was going to bring that up too. That you know Bessie could potentially be the reason there's so many sunk boats. See, what sucks is I'm the cryptid enthusiast, so I should be the one diving down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but I immediately went, no, I bet there's a reasonable explanation for this. The whole time you were talking about your thing where it's like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of boat crashers. I'm like, yeah, Bessie. Bessie bit those boats in half. <laughs> Guys, while we're recording, I'm going to go ahead and throw this into our uh, general, ch- no, I'm sorry, our cryptid cryptid chat for you guys to look at because this, um, quote, reenactment <laughs> is just fucking fantastic. Oh my God, it's so terrible. A reenactment of what? So excited. Y'all need to join our Discord, man, if you haven't already, because then you get to see these things as they're happening, and then you'll be like, hey, I know what they're talking about today. Yeah, this is a picture of a, quote, reenactment of Bessie attacking a small child. (laughs) (laughs) Now, that's pretty accurate. Um, I think that might be describing the 1994. Five incident. Oh, you're not that far off. This is the 2001 <laughs> incident. Okay. Oh my god. Other than this ridiculous picture, I think I think a capsized boat would make sense with those size changes too, huh? Probably. And like Kiki has said, sturgeons get to be quite freaking huge. Oh, I know yeah. we've talked about it before. Oh, yeah. So I just want to point out though that 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 child was okay. Um. I know in that reenactment, well, it looks Photoshop, pretty bad. The Photoshop creature didn't murder the child. Thank God. No. Right. <laughs> this is why we have AI art because that's an abomination. I don't. Oh I don't God. know what that is. Um, it's like a real child in a painting of somebody who is trying to make a knockoff Godzilla. Like- yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank goodness that um, this child was fine and it, he did get bit by something though. Yeah, probably a muskie. A bofin, actually. A bofin. Uh, and I will show you a picture of what the skull of this fish looks like. <laughs> and then you'll understand uh, why that hurt a lot. Yeah, these guys are little nasty effers. Yeah, that is probably in real life what bit that poor child. Cute! Yeah. Yuck. Anyway. <laughs> you can follow along in Discord later on when we... uh put this out so anyway that picture hurts me yeah that's that's rough yeah it's not yeah it looks nasty that's i mean that's definitely like a dead one that ha- is oh yeah dying, but one. yeah are you gonna bring up um anything about where the legend actually came from where did the legend wait, wait, what do you mean the legend came from lake erie <laughs> it came from the first people's tribes around lake erie yes the iroquois they spoke of the own yare which was a water spirit that lived in the Great Lakes. One of a couple, actually. Uh, this one was the horned dragon snake that breathed poison and fire, because <laughs> one isn't just good enough. And it was known to capsize canoes and eat people whole. Fun. Yeah. Although you would be spared if you knew to give it something to eat, something to offer it. Yeah, like a child that you didn't really want. <laughs> like that child right there. In the photograph. Some, yeah. just, some <laughs> discarded fish bleedings. Yeah, something along those lines, you know. Child. <laughs> Uncle Ted. Beloved pet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it must be beloved. <laughs> On the other side, Lake Superior, there is also a dragon that 
the Ojibwa called a, a name that I'm going to just completely annihilate. I think it's uh, Mishi Biju. We call it Mishi Peshu. So I'm going to go with that because it's a lot easier to say. Uh, that's the anglicized version of it. Again, another like a uh, shape shifting creature as well. Horned lynx with scales and webbed paws. This is actually seen in a pictograph in the area. So. They did draw pictures of this as well. And French and English settlers swore that they saw this thing. So that would be like 1600s. And that is resembled a large lizard. So even Lake Superior has one. And uh, oh, again, water cat or shapeshifter is what the Mishi Peshu is. It can be a water cat, but it also shifts into this like lizard thing. So spirit from another realm. That's what I think. I'm going with that. I'm going with a migrating school of plesiosaur. Yeah. That one. Yeah. They <laughs> go around. They're more like a gang because they just like, ah, oh, there's a boat. Let's go beat it up. You know? And that's why there's so many ships that's that have sunk. They almost wished real life was as whimsical as that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I really do really do. Hey, you never know. Never say never, man. I know, right? When we find the plesiosaur in the lake, dude, everyone's gonna feel like such an idiot that laughed at you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. When we find so it, so just me then is we... that is what you're saying? Uh, if you think you're the only person that's laughed at me <laughs> for thinking <laughs> Bessie, Nessie, <laughs> the Squonk, any of my lovely creatures exist, <laughs> Kiki, <laughs> you're not. Wow. But one day I'll show them. I'll show them all. Oh boy. Okay, that's taking a darker turn than I anticipated. No, I meant like I'm gonna find. I'm gonna show. Them oh, you're gonna show them. them. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes. I'm sense. gonna yeah. show them the cryptids. <laughs> well, at that point, they won't be cryptids. They will just be animals. Show me the real life animal. Here's a picture of a sturgeon. <laughs> oh fuck. Because <laughs> that's probably what it is. <laughs> but that's not fun, you know. Yeah, I feel you. So hey, speaking of fun, let's talk about murder. Oh. Okay. That's my third favorite fun activity to do. I want to talk about this one because this is a freaky boating accident. Probably because of Bessie. Well, uh, yeah. I, I don't... See, it gets We've really talked... cold up there. So. We've talked about a lot of things today already that could sink a boat, so let's not just leave it up to one. Although yeah. it is, Although it is probably Bessie. Oh, for sure. Well, what's kind of funny is that this is called the SS Marquette and Bessemer number two there's only enough space for one bessie in this here lake yeah the marquette and bessemer number one <laughs> <laughs> no bessie the sister <laughs> ship that didn't sink okay yeah so apparently there is this uh legend that the sister of one of the wheelmen on the marquette and bessemer two had a harrowing nightmare in which she's hearing her brother john call out to her during a violent storm and that she had this dream about three days before the vessel made its last voyage and yes i know that makes his name john clancy and then you're just like wait a minute i did look it up he was a wheelman and he did die on the ship so that's just a funny coincidence anyway this ship was setting out for port stanley ontario it was a car ferry but before you think of like cars it Rail car, rail car ferry. Okay. And it was coming out of uh, Conneaut Harbor. It had 30 rail cars on it. Most of them are loaded up with coal. There was no stern gate on this boat, although the sister ship did have one. Now, there were some warnings about that. This was something that was going to help out with when there's high, it's kind of funny to say high seas, but that's kind of like what it's like on Great Lakes. When there's a lot of water that's coming up over, it will stop some of that water from coming all the way into the ship and like, interfering with your boiler well this one didn't have that and famous last words captain robert mcleod says don't worry about it i'll take care of it at the end of the shipping season well the wind is gusting at 70 miles per hour and it's snowing okay so just keep in mind it gets cold so i'm still a little not convinced that a plesiosaur is gonna be able to like withstand this kind of cold in such a shallow lake okay poor bessie but McLeod, he decides he's going to take a ship into uh, the what some would say, quote, a gray bearded hell. And I'm, I love that. Now, if nobody knows what, <laughs> what I'm talking about with gray beards, it's not like a bunch of old men swimming in the lake. That's, That's immediately what, what I thought. Yeah, same. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, buddy, there's nothing wrong. We just didn't get a chance to have a shave. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
gray beards. It's a type of wave in the ocean in stormy seas. It'll exceed 60 feet in height. Oh, I saw some pictures of these. I was like, oh, that's a grape. Okay. I didn't know that was like the term for it. It's also called a Cape Horn roller because that's usually where it happened at. But you can still get these kind of waves in the Great Lakes. So yay. Anywho, now you know. So anyway, uh, temperature was already falling from the 40 degree high that it was that morning. (laughs) And so these sailors are like, tonight is going to suck. In the 24 hours after number two departed, <laughs> that's funny. I just realized that I wrote number two departed. <laughs> wow, we should flush that joke. Yeah, we should totally. That's stank. I hate both of you so goddamn much. <laughs> <laughs> See, Court, those are that's that's funny. What we just did there, that was funny. What you do, what you do is not funny. See what I did there? Is I said doo doo. Mm, I chuckled at that. How dare I? How dare you, <laughs> JC? You're the shit. (laughs) (laughs) Gord's getting so mad. I'll stop. I'll stop. I'll stop. (sighs) We got to stop saying all these crappy jokes, you know? Anyway, um, please, I beg of you. <laughs> there are numerous reports coming from people, um, both on shore and in vessels, uh, about when they catch a glimpse of the ship. So there's a tugboat captain who says that he was making his way back to port, struggling pretty bad at this point himself, and that he passed the ferry in Open Lake in the early afternoon. Port Stanley man claimed to have seen the boat approach the Ontario side harbor, but turn away because of dangerous conditions. Seven miles east of Port Stanley, another man was said he was awakened by the steam whistle and he thought the vessel was already on shore, but that was 5 a.m. There was another person who said that they heard the distress whistle at 1 a.m. the following day. Uh, so there's a little bit of different times there. But it seems as though the multiple contradictory stories is because the captain was probably trying to seek safe harbor and finding none, he at some point turned back towards Erie. 72 hours after it sailed out, a debris field was noted by William B. Davick, the steamer, as it traveled westbound towards Long Point. They sent a message to Cleveland reporting the debris, which included a green lifeboat painted with the number two. The Commodore Perry was then sent out to provide evidence of the tragedy. And around noon on December 12th, it did encounter the fourth lifeboat. These were numbered, so they're supposed to launch a numerical order. They find that there were nine frozen bodies in the half-sunken lifeboat. This is a quote from the appearance of the y'all boat, meaning the, I'm not saying y'all, it's Y-A-W-L for those who are are not (laughs) sure, okay? (laughs) So the yawl, which is also another word for a lifeboat, it is evident that the men left their ship in a mad hurry, probably to escape being engulfed as she floundered and had been tossed in the icy blizzard until they were frozen to death. Passengers missing since Tuesday, all hope has been abandoned. There's two mysteries, though, on board this lifeboat. First is the presence of clothing without a body. So it looked as though there were 10 people on board. And they speculate that one of the men went insane and ripped off his clothes and just flung himself into the water, killing himself, obviously, very quickly. Maybe quicker than worrying about whether he was going to freeze to death for hours, he just kind of died. The second thing that was kind of weird was that one of the men was dressed in only an overall and jumpers, that's a quote, which was the steward, but he had taken his time In other words, he didn't dress himself very well. Like, they must have had, like, no time to get dressed. But if you think about this, he didn't have time to find any clothing extra to put on so he wouldn't die of hypothermia. But he did have his two long galley knives and a meat cleaver. The speculation there. As a chef, I'm just going to tell you, I am not that. I love my knives. But, like, if it's the coat or the knives... In this situation, I'm going to have to go with the coat because I can buy new knives. What you don't know is that his wife had just bought him those knives three (laughs) weeks beforehand. And she said, if you and this is like the third set he's gotten within a year. And she said, if you don't come home with those knives, you better not come home at all, because I swear I swear to Bessie, I will. (laughs) So he did what he thought was best. (laughs) I just thinking people around the Great Lakes now just go, I swear to Bessie. 
since you know they're supposed to be launched in order and this is the fourth lifeboat you're like where's the other three there was speculation about whether or not there was a fight to get on the single lifeboat and did the steward gain an upper hand via his knives i'd rather have knives and go into a fight with somebody that doesn't have knives there's a book called long gone by author david frew F-R-E-W. And he kind of said that there's a pragmatic part of this. Like, well, the knives were essential to a steward's livelihood. And so there was no sense in leaving them behind because they were something easy to grab. Fair. Uh, again, I will say to you as a chef, uh, no. Because no. you see, the, the captain's body was finally recovered when it came up on shore on October the 6th, 1910. And... Guess what was on his body? Knife wounds. <laughs> Knife wounds. Okay. Several severe slashing wounds, as a matter of fact. He took slashing damage, guys. Slashing damage. Sheesh. So, Fru goes on to say that Captain McLeod had a spotless re reputation, that he was a, quote, gentleman and captain, and so it was unlikely that, that a fight broke out for that spot, challenging the steward. But... <laughs> I don't know, man. People do weird things when it's time to save your own life. Yeah. yeah. And a very interesting tale to tell as far as they wind up both dying in the end anyway. But, you know, one gets to live, uh, what, an hour longer, possibly. Do you think that maybe the captain was like, yo, I'm, I'm going to go down with the ship. I didn't replace the stern wall or door, whatever it was called. Stern gate. The gate. Um, I deserve I deserve this. I'm the captain. It's what needs to go it out. And the steward's like, yeah, no, I'm getting on this boat. You're not getting in my way. And started stabbing him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. I'm going to kill you before the ship sinks. <laughs> so you can't go down with the ship, idiot. Who knows? This, this again, sounds very much like the D&D &D party that doesn't let the GM like, finish the <laughs> sentence. <laughs> So you see one last seat, and the captain, who's known as a good, he's, he's standing there, the he looks at you, he looks at the seat, he looks at you, and he's about to say, and I stab him. <laughs> Sneak attack! <Yep. laughs> the rogue, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Fuck yes. <laughs> Massive critical damage, roll the 20, sneak attack. Doubled that shit, got the fucking seat, oh, oh. and then died anyway. Because <laughs> yeah, of his low HP pool from being uh, <sighs> a scared. Yeah. Yes. yes. He didn't dump his highest stat in the con, which was a mistake because he only lasted another hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what the <laughs> captain was trying to say was take my coat and get on the boat. <laughs> you All dick. he did say, though, was. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> what the fuck? Look at us making jokes about dead people. <laughs> Tragedy. Oh, probable murder victim. Yeah. That's a little crude, but... I'm okay with it. I'll be able to sleep tonight. Not a problem. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. This is the jewel of Lake Erie. No one can find the sunken vessel. Ooh. Yeah. And, uh... When, I was, when you were talking about people not raiding, there is a story that Albert J. Weiss, who was the treasurer of the Keystone Fish Company of Erie, Pennsylvania, had boarded the vessel at the last minute. Talk about fucking bad luck. He was traveling to purchase a Canadian fishing firm. The amount of cash that was stated is between 30000 and 50000 And possibly that money would be locked in the car ferry's safe. If standard protocol had been followed by the purser. So that means that possibly there could be between thirty and fifty thousand dollars locked up in a safe at the bottom of Lake Erie. Even if it's paper money, that's still fifty grand, you know, like I ain't gonna I ain't gonna wag a finger at that as the old people say them great. No, I'm not buying a boat. Got it. <laughs> Buy a boat? How much yeah. do you think a boat costs? Well no, I mean like I'm not going to go buy a boat and then spend 10 years of my life trying to find 50 grand. Oh, I thought you meant if you found it, could you buy oh, a boat? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm not going to go buy a boat now and like become a pirate before they make it a state park. Yeah, no, you're not going to have time for that. If nobody has found it till like now, then, you know. Challenge accepted. 
BRB three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, wow. we have recording to do. Okay, JC's, so anyway. JC's confident. Jesus. No so one else has ever done is, it. Three they've weeks. never had... They've never had Bessie help, you know, and that's who I'm going to ask for assistance. Now, that doesn't necessarily have a like a ghost story attached to it. But I do think that it was interesting. His sister had a premonition, supposedly, about this. And I like the little like, you know, extra possible murder and the can't find the ship and, and the money. That's cool. But then there's the SSGP Griffith. This is one of the worst disasters. As I said before, it's the third largest as far as loss of life. So this poor thing, uh, June 16th, 1850, departed Buffalo, heading towards Toledo, and it had 326 passengers on board. They were recent immigrants from England, Ireland, Germany, and Scandinavia. So that's kind of sad because you're all like, okay, I'm going to, yay, I'm in the new world. And now I'm on fire because that's what happened. Huge fire breaks out. At one point, uh, there was I know there were two survivors in particular who worked for the Western Electric Company. They were able to talk about what happened. The captain threw his wife into the lake in an attempt to save her. Then he did the same for his mother and his child. And the wife of the ship's barber uh, helped him off the boat before he jumped in himself. But um, the captain and his whole family perished. The only person who made it out was the barber's wife. And she was the only woman to survive this at all. It caught on fire because of the boilers exploding. And it kind of was heading towards the sandbar. So it winds up being on the sandbar as well. It gets towed away after, you know, the aftermath of, of everything. And they're trying to identify bodies and all of this. It was still burning as they were towing it back. So there was 37 people who survived, at least 241 dead. But they think that that could be higher because the estimates for who was on board it was like a little bit off so it was like 326 people were supposed to be on board and then 30 of them survived is th so there's a little bit of discrepancy there i was kind of just i would say disappointed but there's not a whole lot of ghost story attached to this either even though it's considered one of the greatest tragedies on the great lakes and um I think that actually I wanted to talk about it because it goes to show that like not every single tragedy that happens has to have a ghost story attached to it. Sometimes things just happen and people don't stay around. But there is the lighthouse. This store is a little messed up. So I mentioned earlier South Bass Island. Well, the South Bass Island lighthouse. We're going to talk about that. This is this is freaky and it's got an actual ghost story attached to it. Okay. And I'm going to tell one other quick thing, which didn't happen in Lake Erie, but I still think it, well, no, it did. Oh, I take that back. I have two things. One thing didn't happen in Lake Erie, but it's still fucking cool. And the other one did. So anyway, South Bass Island Lighthouse. It's built in 1897. There's a naval officer named Harry Riley. He is going to take over as the lighthouse keeper. Uh, he is the first lighthouse keeper and will become the most famous lighthouse keeper. He and his wife moved into it in uh, July of 1897. Things were going great, but then he decides he's going to hire someone to help out doing work around the lighthouse. The lighthouse is beautiful. It's a Queen Anne style home and the lighthouse is, it itself is like in that. It's really cool looking. So he hires this guy. I mean, they move in in July and he the, hires this guy in August, the, the following year, August of 1898. He finds a guy named Samuel Anderson. He's going to be their part-time caretaker. Samuel loves this idea because he's working part-time at a place called Hotel Victory. Hotel Victory is a very interesting story. Historically, I might just mention it. Maybe I'll do a short like side thing on it. But Hotel Victory turns out to be one of the, it was actually at the time, the largest hotel. It had over 600 rooms. And this is Ooh, the wow. 1800s. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It had some terrible luck. And it winds up being in disrepair. So there's very, very little of it left today that you can see inside the park. But its foundation, I think, is still there. So Harry allows Samuel room and board as part of his compensation. So he's over the moon. He thinks it's the best thing ever. Samuel's a, a little bit strange. Some people today might say that he is uh, a little bit mentally unstable. He likes to keep to himself and uh, he likes to collect snakes on the island and his room is in the basement and he's taking these snakes down into the basement and he's keeping them there so that's always fun just a collection well, of snakes in the basement yeah i was just say why <laughs> 
Yeah. Why you bring your snakes along with, bro? I don't know. Well, I mean, who the mom? His mom's not gonna take care of him. Why not? <laughs> she doesn't like snakes. She told him, "I swear, if you get another snake, you're gonna have to find <laughs> another place to live." And then he went to a reptile expo, saw another snake for sale, and was like, "Hey, and a job advertisement with a place to live." Win, win, win. What the hell are you talking about? And so well, anyway, got... well, I'm leaving that in. Okay. So in the summer of 1898, <laughs> a smallpox epidemic breaks out and everyone's placed under quarantine. Uh-oh. No one enters. No one leaves. What's kind of interesting is that, you know, back then when you were quarantined, they sent in the cavalry to make sure you didn't fucking leave because you didn't want to spread smallpox to the rest of the fucking country. I'm just saying, patriots. I was going to make a joke, and then you got real serious about the same subject I was going to make a joke on. Yeah. (laughs) I'll let that one lie. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, God, it's so rough. Got to stay in my house. This is terrible. Except for this guy, I guess he, well, he was super paranoid. Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe, maybe some of these people are paranoid, and they just didn't want to have to stay in their house. Well, anyway. Maybe. He goes a little extra cray cray. All right. So it's reported that he's refused to enter the lighthouse again. He's been seen wandering around the grounds, howling at the sky. Like a werewolf. Not yelling. It specifically says howling. Like he's, yeah, he's howling. He does this all night long. When dawn breaks, he's nowhere to be found. Nobody can find Samuel. Unfortunately, they find him dead at the base of a cliff near the lighthouse. And nobody knows what happened. Some people speculated that he jumped because of his paranoia and induced panic. Some people say he was pushed by maybe somebody who had enough of a shit, as in the howling. Who knows? There was no signs of foul play, though. It just looks like, you know, he fell over the cliff. And so death by suicide. And you think the story ends there, but it doesn't. Because just a few days later, on September the 2nd, Harry's found on the mainland, or lighthouse keeper. And he's wandering around near the city of Sandusky. And he's acting absolutely insane for example at one point he apparently tells the people around him that he owns a bunch of horses and that he's got the fastest horse and he is encouraging people to come out to the island to see them race because his will break any speed record except that the rileys did not own a horse so no one understood what the hell he was talking about so then they said he's drunk and disorderly after they realized he's not drunk and disorderly, they charge him with being a, quote, insane person. He's committed to an asylum in Toledo for observation. Remember the good old days when it was illegal to be insane? <laughs> yeah, right? God, it's kind of that way now. It's just a death sentence. Uh, so while Harry's locked up, there's another man that's brought in named Otto Ritchie, and he and Harry's wife wind up running the lighthouse. So they officially review Harry's post and decide that he's, quote, hopelessly insane. And that's grounds for termination. Can't be insane and run a lighthouse. Apparently not a good combination. I can kind of understand that, though. He's That's a huge responsibility. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can't be telling people to race horses you don't have. Especially on a uh, <laughs> lake that's as treacherous as Erie. A yes. lighthouse is important. So just not the job for him. This is all figured out on February 23rd of 1899. By March of 1899, Harry is dead. There are no records indicating how he died, though, because the privacy laws are still protecting that information. Nobody has made any official connections between Samuel's death and Harry's insanity, which seemed to come on suddenly. Of course, the rumors start because this is a small town on an island. So (laughs) everybody's like, we figured it out. Harry had enough of Sam's bullshit, tossed him off the cliff, thought better of it, felt bad, went insane with grief and remorse over what he had done. Clearly, that's what happened. So paranormal activity starts up, though. In 1907, there's an article in the Ohio Magazine that pretty much makes the idea of this lighthouse being haunted public. Lydia J. Ryle, the author of the article, she claims that Samuel Anderson has continued to walk the grounds of the South Bass Island Lighthouse. And then another strange occurrence happens, though. In 1925, another guy dies exactly the same way as Samuel. 
Charles Dugan. He'd been a lighthouse keeper since 1908. He's found dead at the base of the cliff in like pretty much the same place. That's a little creepy. That is a bit creepy. Slippery cliff. Yeah. Yeah. Claim two people. Nothing about him, but that's a very interesting coincidence. I mean, nothing about him as far as paranormal, but that's an interesting coincidence as the same place, right? The same way. Maybe it's just really slippery there. People leaving their banana peels behind. I don't know. So the idea, (laughs) I eat a banana here every day. Why did I fall in now? I feel like that's another D and D campaign. (laughs) Mystery solved. Can you see any banana peels here? What the hell's going on? So to this day, people will still say, and I love, I love saying that to this day, people will still say they see Samuel's ghost haunting the grounds. Interestingly, not, not Harry. Wonder why. And not Dugan. Wonder why. Good stuff. So the other one that's Lake Erie is the black dog of Lake Erie. Yeah, yeah. So this is not a black shook thing, though. This is actually a large Newfoundland or a Newf, as some people call them. This is near Welland Canal is where supposedly this happens. It was a ship's mascot and it fell overboard. And apparently nobody was willing to rescue the poor dog and it drowned. And then it wound up haunting the shit out of everybody. <laughs> You go, dog. That's so upsetting. All right, that, it is upsetting. But now the dog not only haunted everybody on the ship that was unwilling to rescue him, but apparently you will now see this dog on your ship. It means that there's impending doom or you're about to get into some trouble. So you better beware. This dog is linked to a wreck of the Mary Jane that happened in 1881 and has now supposedly traveled across the Great Lakes and is seen on doom ships in lake ontario and lake michigan i feel like that's like a whole ass story though i thought it was interesting and i read this a while back and i cannot find i just can't find the information about it so maybe maybe a listener will know this story but i think this one is like Huron, though so it's not like Erie, but it's still worth mentioning because this kind of shit used to happen all the time they're on this vessel and uh i think it was a schooner they're on this ship and it's in lake Huron, and The captain has a new kid on board, right? And he tells the kid to go up and fix the mast or fix the sails or something to that effect. Everybody on board knew that the rope going up there, because there was like a chair attached to it, and you would like, you know, shimmy yourself and the chair up there by pulling on the rope. Everybody knew this rope was like screwed, but nobody told the kid. So he gets in the chair and he goes up there and the rope breaks and he falls to his death on the deck. But right before he dies, like right there in front of everybody, he curses the captain, which I would too. I'd be like, you fucking knew. Sure. For the next three days, because this is like out in the lake. This is in the middle of the lake when this happens. For the next three days, everybody on board there claims that they have seen his ghost as this white apparition of fog and that it will like come out of nowhere and then stop right where he died on the deck. And that it's like irritating everybody and it's like scaring people. And so as soon as they dock the ship, everybody's like, fuck this ship. I'm out of here. You caused this problem. You knew. You knew. But I'm like, well, you all probably knew too. But, you know, whatever. So they leave the captain. The captain's like, fine, whatever. I'm picking up this coal shipment. I'm out of here. I'm just going to keep going. And then the captain and the ship are never seen again. Uh oh. And I wish I could find it. I can't. I, I try to look this up and I don't know. I don't know why it's not coming up. Because oddly enough, like when Cord and I just were talking before we started recording that, you try to look up just stories to get a feel for what we wanted to talk about because so much shit happened in Lake, all these lakes, really. And I'm like, are you kidding me that I find like a billion other things on Lake Huron, but I can't find that one story? Dang it. But anyway, so if none of you guys have anything else to add to Lake Erie, I want to go fishing. Yeah, Cord, let's go. Nice. Let's go. I'm going to pay a professional here on uh, Lake Nakamixon, is where they're out of. It's like 125 bucks for three hours with a kid so that he can get taught how to fish by a professional because I like to fish, but I'm not a professional. Fair. I think that'd be better if mommy and son went and learned to get re I kind of have to relearn because it has been whole oh, like 15 years since I cast at least 15 years, maybe more. So I think that's a reasonable, I think that's a reasonable price for three hours for two people to learn. How much was it? 125 for three hours oh yeah that's that's not bad yeah and it's like it's kind of one-on-one because he doesn't take a whole bunch of people he only takes like four people total so 
you might be with like two other people then. Unless, of course, you know, you and Cord want to come fishing with us. Okay, so our musician today, this was kind of interesting. So, you know, we do a lot with playlists for Spotify, and we're also going to be redoing our TikTok for music, kind of streamlining that for more like music recommendations and things like that. And I get a lot of emails. I'm not joking. I get like a ton of emails from people looking to get put on one of our playlists, which is amazing to me. But anyway, I got an email from this very nice woman named Stella Prince. And I listened to her song called Two Face. And I was like, oh my God, can I play this song on on the podcast? Because it's good. It is not a genre that I particularly get into. You know me, I'm like the goth and the industrial and the hard rock and the metal and whatever. But I still have an appreciation for everything outside of that. But her voice is amazing. So that is who you're going to listen to right now. Stella Prince with her new song called Two Face. She's not on Bandcamp yet, but she's on Spotify and she has a YouTube channel as well. So give her a listen. She's definitely on Instagram. Also, in my mind, I'm trying to figure out who I would compare her to. She definitely has a Joni Mitchell type feel. Joan Baez, Judy Collins, Joni Mitchell, really beautiful voice, super talented. And um, yeah, I think I think she's going to be a hit, honestly. Anyway, give a listen to that. And when we get back, Spooky Squad updates. <laughs> Shout out to another female uh, musician that we had on much earlier in the summer, and that was Summer Woods. She has her Instagram up and running, and she's been doing a lot of like music lessons and things that she does when she's writing, and that's really interesting. So check that out too. I've been following a lot of Philadelphia stuff on Instagram, and I don't. <sighs> what is with driving in Philly, y'all? I don't. What are you doing to yourselves? Like, is bad. It's been really bad. And then there was the SEPTA trolley crash. Yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, there was two SEPTA buses that crashed into each other and one of them was on fire and it was terrible. And then a trolley crashes into a building. That's the fifth SEPTA crash. Public transportation has suddenly become a nightmare it, it, more so in Philly than usual. <laughs> like, what the fuck? If y'all are not following Rob Sheridan on Instagram, he's awesome. Really want him on the show at some point. He's so freaking cool. So he did a lot of the artwork and stuff for Nine Inch Nails. And right now he's an AI videographer and artist. And he does these absolutely insane, creepy ass things that at one point people took it really seriously and thought that there was like this gross like bloodbath going on in New York City. What? Really? He put together an AI video of Barbenheimer and it's, yeah, it's freaking priceless. So that's, that's cool. Also just Dixie Crystals, a drag queen from, from Denver is now following us. And I just fucking love that. That's an incredible drag queen name. I Dix- I love her. Dixie Crystals? I fucking love her. So I. That's incredible. Yeah. So uh, she's out of. um 
Denver, and she's going to be doing something pretty cool with a band that uh, we have promoted, and that's Bonnie and the Mere Mortals. Yeah, I was pretty excited nice. about that. Pretty excited Very about that. Nice. So Bonnie and the Mere Mortals, they've got a new album coming out. It's a live album, live and unplugged album. That's going to be out like uh, very soon, very, very soon. And we're going to be playing in one of their new songs in October for a spooky season. I love Bonnie. She's freaking great. So anyway, yes, uh, she's doing an event with uh, Dixie Crystal in, um, in Denver. And then uh, recently we had got two years ago and like a year and a half ago at this point, we played different songs from Pink Shift. And Pink Shift was on is on tour and they're having a blast and they're doing freaking awesome. So proud of them. Uh, Jiraiya is doing fantastic. He did a tour and we're going to be playing one of his songs in uh, October as well. Something new. I, I love working with these guys. They're so much fun. I think that's the update on like the music scene as far as like new stuff coming out. And then I just want to say uh, there was a lot of controversy that just happened recently with the International Fencing League. <sighs> what really yeah so the ukrainian was fighting a russian i'm sorry fighting <laughs> fencing a russian it was it was a bloodbath though the ukrainian whooped her ass it was just an ass whooping of biblical proportions and that's saying something as someone who doesn't believe in the bible but anyway um <laughs> that's funny <laughs> It was a Hava Mall proportions, guys. It was insane. It was like Thor came down and just lightning bolted that bitch. So, you know, so she loses. And um, Olga, who's also a four-time world champion from Ukraine, she doesn't shake her hand. She's like, no, because this Russian is supposed to be, she's not fencing as Russian. She's fencing as, quote, neutral. See, this is how these fuckers get around being in sports activities right now. Uh yeah so but she's not neutral because her brother is in the army and she's got all kinds of pictures of herself with the russian army and the you know russian paraphernalia on on instagram like just days before the competition so she's not neutral she's pro-russia okay that's fine except that your country is invading the ukrainians right now so i don't think she should have to shake her hand i'm sorry and so as a fencer myself uh no fuck that shit so olga instead put her saber out and she says no if you want to touch swords i'll do that but i am not shaking your hand there are some regulations i understand like you have to like you're not allowed to leave unless there's a handshake at the end or whatever but those rules and regulations were changed up during covid because there was no handshaking during covid there was clashing of swords at the end to signify the end of the fight right so in in essence olga's retro going back and saying well let's just do this the Russian refuses. Everything's fine until the Russian decides that she's going to make a big deal about this. And so she gets Olga disqualified from the rest of the tournament. And the reason the disqualification went through is because there's not one but two Russian oligarchs who are on the board of the fencing league. One of them is wanted in multiple countries for rape and human trafficking. And the other one, Peskov, is uh is is being sanctioned right now by the united states both of them are okay neither one of them is on the board under russia one of them is flying a, a f the flag of mexico and the other one's flying the flag of kazakhstan and they're claiming they're neutral but both of them are russian oligarchs both of them are wanted criminals right now one of them is claiming that he doesn't live in russia but his address his telephone number everything is still in russia everybody's fucking pissed right they're like you are infiltrating international sporting events to disqualify ukrainians so you're not only trying to kill them physically but you're trying to crush their souls by taking this shit away from them so i was hot i was still on twitter at the time i'm off now but i basically was like fuck you fuck this fuck that i might get <laughs> I was sort of trying to see if I was going to get banned uh, before the end. But I I had, as of this recording, I've, I have two days left. I have not been banned yet. We'll see what happens. Hopefully I just leave. <laughs> but I was really hot. Some some asshole Republican was like, well, you got to play by the rules. And I was like, fuck you, you insurrectionist piece of shit. Play by the rules. So the, the happy ending is that the, the Olympic Committee, they sent a letter to Olga telling her that she would not have to put up with those types of shenanigans when she 
plays in the Olympics. And I was like, well, that's good. I, as a fencer, I am, I'm hot. I'm so angry. And I don't know the only way that this was allowed to happen is because there are two Russian oligarchs who are funneling money into it. Frick. Yeah. Frick. Anyway, there's, there was, there was my rant. Okay. It wasn't about trees. It was about fencing. Yeah. Not nearly as important <laughs> as I don't like being hot and in the sun. Eww. Yours is political and, uh, well, Who it's sad. Cares? It's sad. It's sad that it has to be that way. It is. You know. It is. My turn to complain about something yet? Go ahead. No, got, you get next time. Episode. Here's what I got to complain about. You guys complain too much. I love you guys. <laughs> I know what you guys have anything to complain about. <laughs> Hey, look, I I swear to God that as soon as I get off of Twitter, I probably won't even have anything to complain about because I won't be seeing a lot of that stuff as as readily uh, on threads. It's mostly my artists, musicians. I'm, I'm not blocking it out. I am friends with a lot of the fellas, the NAFO group. OK, so if there's something going on in Ukraine, I'll be able to pick that up. And that's important because I just hey, want to know. know. You know how I don't get pissed off about it? Because you don't have any social media at all, but <laughs> no one will know about the podcast unless I, I have do a social Facebook media. that I don't post that on. You don't post on, I was going to say. <laughs> or interact with in any way or go on. Oh, unless you, your complaint is always, I can't believe these fucking Bigfoot people. Dude. The- <laughs> <laughs> ah, you know it. Dude, I was just reeling the other day about it again. <laughs> These people, dude. I love Bigfoot, <laughs> but the the Facebook groups bring in some. I'm not gonna. I don't want to say crazy. I don't want to call anyone crazy. I don't know what you've seen, but you are eccentric, boy. Howdy. Some people <laughs> just like oh. every single thing that they see in the woods is Bigfoot, man. Like there. Like I, that's I a squirrel, not that Bigfoot. I understand the possibility of Bigfoot is there, but like, dude, somebody built a lean-to. It's on a walking path. Breathe. It's not Bigfoot. It's a dude. Somebody was hiking, wanted to take a nap, chill, man. Holy smokes! You think ten foot tall Bigfoot's gonna sit down and be comfortable in a three foot tall lean-to? The hell sense does that make? Sir, a child built that lean-to. Yeah, you know. To get out of the sun. Yeah, because there were probably no goddamn trees. I sit there and think, like, how much time I spent moving around sticks in the woods. Like, how (laughs) much I must have scared some Bigfoot enthusiasts in the 90s, man. Like, they must have went through my backyard and was like, wow, there's Bigfoot er everywhere in this area because they've moved these sticks away from the damn trees a little bit. Y'all need to breathe. Not everything in the woods is a sign of Bigfoot being there. <laughs> humans humans still live in the woods in Pennsylvania. We are in there. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying they didn't see Bigfoot ever. I, I didn't see what they seen, but just some people are, uh, we'll say, overzealous in their attempts to find evidence. So besides uh, cleaning up TikTok by October, and we're going to be opening up a brand new uh, merchandise store in october as well i've been working on some new really cool stickers and patreon is gonna have a lot more D related stuff added to it for funsies little extras that we're coming up with and two things one is that cord did a reading on october pod very similar to what i've already did and that's live now it's called uh <laughs> October Pod's Guide to Fishing. <laughs> yeah, was, he's laughing. That was, that was a fun read. <laughs> and Tales of Thern officially wrapped up season three, and the final episode is out. I think it was a lot of fun. I think we had, of course, I think we did a great job. I think Ben's a fantastic storyteller. So, so that is done. And we are, as of this recording, I will be doing session zero in about a week to get everything prepped and ready to go and we're gonna be doing our q a session for the fans over at tales of thern so if you're also listening to well i say us because we've done all kinds of stuff with them in the past uh and of course they're still doing stuff with us so we had to push 
a little bit back on Cord versus Cryptid because Logan had to finish up this final episode because it was always three hours long. So three hours, that's a lot to edit, I know. Uh, so the next Cord versus Cryptid might be a little bit later than I was anticipating, but it will get done. It'll be fine. Yeah, so I think that's it for outside Mission Spooky recordings. Yep. And I'm going to say that I had a great time on the 30th with everybody on Discord having a little party uh, for leaving Twitter. So it was fun. Hopefully more than one person will show up like last time. It's going to be it's going to be like you and and me. Yeah. Yeah. Cord and I are going to be talking. Probably. Yeah. I'll be on. If I remember, I got to be reminded like eight more times. But. No, it's fine. All right. So taking us out today, once again, is the beautiful voice of Stella Prince with her song Two Face. And again, you can find that on YouTube and Spotify. And you can find her on Instagram to keep up with her latest tours and where she's going to be playing. As always, stay spooky and don't die. But if you do, contact us. If you could, what I'm going to need you to do. Now, this is a multi-step thing. I get it. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. I'm going to need you to go and plant some trees, specifically at Cherry Springs uh, State Park around their campsites. Now, this might, you know, be considered illegal, but you're planting trees. Who's going to care? Definitely not the state park. And it's not like I'm recommending you to do this. I'm just saying if you want to get in contact with us, this is probably the best way to do it. You're going to go plant some trees there, right? Then you're going to take a photo of the trees being planted there, print that, go to CVS or someplace, print that out, send that to us with your message on the, written on the back. 